Good morning. Welcome to Bible. This is lesson 164 for Bible. It is Friday, so the rest of your lessons today should be um, lesson 165 um, for most of your classes. So <clears throat> we are, we have one week left, guys, um, of, of school. And so um, it's exciting and we have a lot that will get done, but um, first of all, we have a big number six up here, but it's Friday, which means that we only have the days next week. And so if you are paying attention, six is what we wrote up yesterday. So what do we, we need to change it. So let's see, let's see if I have Max. All right, Max. Hi, Max. All right. Oh, you brought a friend with you? You have a friend, Max? <laughs> Okay, well, who'd you bring with you? That's who you brought? Uh, I don't know if we want, if we want to bring. Okay, all right, so Max brought Mimi the owl. And so um, I thought you guys might enjoy seeing another little stuffed animal. Um, so, all right, let's see, Max and Mimi, how many days do we have left? We've got six up here, but that's not the right number. Okay, so help me out. Okay, so, all right, Max, what do you think? How many days do you think it is, Max? <laughs> Max, we're not going up in number. You keep going up. I, I mean, 11 days. I, I don't know, Max. I don't, I don't think so. I think we have less than that. Three days. Oh, Max says three days. Okay, no, Max. We had six, so we have to subtract one. Mimi, can you subtract one? Very good, five. Mimi got the number. Max, you brought a good friend because, because Mimi can count. Okay, very good. All right, so let, we'll let Mimi help, help write the number, all right? Let's see, I'll try to get this in. Very good, we have a nice number five. We'll put up there for the rest of the day. And we'll put Mimi and Max aside, all right. All right, Max, you gotta let me know if you're gonna bring visitors like that. <laughs> but um, we need to look at our verses. So, but first of all, before we jump into 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, we are going to review Psalm 91 verses 1 through 8. So if you need your Bible, get that out so you can say it with us. All right. So we'll do the review one first and then we'll do our verses and we'll do those three times, but we'll do this one once. Psalm 91, 1 through 8. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh at noonday, uh, walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Psalm 91, one through eight, all right? And then back, First Peter 1, 18 and 19, okay? First Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, 
1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Very good. All right, so those verses um, are due next Thursday, all right? You're, um, we will be finished up with our, um, with our lessons, and I will do, with the last lesson, I'll also do a review for the final test, um, which is actually scheduled for Wednesday, okay? So next week, Wednesday is your final Bible test, um, and just so you know, and, and those who've been in the school or been in my class before know that the final test does not have any verses to write out on it. So you don't need to worry about writing out verses on the test, um, but you do need to have those two verses memorized to say for, for me um, on Thursday. So Wednesday is the final Bible test. Thursday is the final rich, or final verse quiz. Sorry, it's not written. Uh, final verse quiz, and then um, I'll have a special Bible um, for that Friday. You will have only a couple of videos for that last day because whatever classes are left are tests, um, but you will have the reading video for your vocab quiz, and I know the Bible, and I'll have to double check if there's anything else, but I think that that is it for that final day. So, um, but you can look for that and, <coughs> pardon me. All right, so we're looking at, um, we're looking at David again. So last time we just looked how David showed kindness to Mephibosheth and he kept his promise to Jonathan, even though Jonathan was not there. Um, you know, some people would say, well, you know, nobody, nobody was there that knew that he made the promise. So why should he keep the promise? But he knew that if he didn't keep this promise that, uh, you know, he would be letting down his friend. And it wasn't just that, uh, that he had made the promise to Jonathan. He felt like that promise was made before God, and God would know if he didn't make the didn't keep the promise. So, um, but now we turn to a low point in David's life, um, and so many of you may, some of you may know uh, this low point in his life. But um, he had been out with his army battling against Ammon and Syria when he decided to go back to the palace for a while. So the Syrian army they they were in battle. The Syrian army fled. Um, from Israel after thousands of men had died, including their captain, Shobach. And so David went home, directed his troops from, from the comfort of his own home. And uh, Joab, his captain, and the rest of the army destroyed Ammon. Well, back at home, David is on out on his rooftop and he's probably looking out over the city, Jerusalem, and um, maybe looking at the stars and admiring the beauty of God, and he looks down and he sees something. He saw a beautiful woman washing herself. David inquired of the servant, servants who she was, and the, they told her, they, I'm sorry, they told him, she's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, all the men were off at battle, as well as including Uriah. So, David sent messengers to bring her to him. As king, he had the authority to do this. But was it right to take another man's wife? If you remember our Ten Commandments song, it's, it says not to covet another man's wife. What David did was wrong. Soon Bathsheba sent word to David that she would have a baby. In an attempt to cover up what he had done, David sent for Uriah from the battlefield. And then, you know, as he gets any soldier that comes back from the battlefield, he has to ask uh, how things are going on the battlefield. So he has a report of what was going on. And then he, he fed him a, a good feast, a good meal, and sent him to his home. But Uriah was an honorable soldier. And he didn't feel right going to his home when his men were still out on the battlefield. And so he slept at the palace where the servants were. When David heard that he hadn't go home, he hadn't gone home, 
he had to try again. So he told him to stay another day, hoping that he would go and see his wife. But again, he slept with the servants. Now, remember how one lie leads to another lie? David was stuck right now because he had lied and he had done what was wrong. But instead of coming clean, instead of telling Uriah the truth, he sent him back to the battlefield with a message for Joab. Okay. That was very common. You have a, have, a me- have a message to send. You'd send a soldier. Um, if there wasn't a soldier, then you'd ser- send a servant. I mean, that's how they did things. So it wasn't unusual. But little did Uriah know that he was carrying his own death sentence. The letter that Joab told him to put Uriah on the front line. And if that wasn't bad enough, He told him to have everyone pull back in the heat of the battle. It was a certain, it was certain death for Uriah. He died in battle and David thought his problems were solved. But our problems are never solved by sinning, which is what David had done. And so we see that David tried to fix his problems himself. He could have gone to God. He could have, he could have told Uriah the truth. As painful as that would have been, but instead he tried to handle it himself and he got himself into more trouble. All right. Well, now, now Uriah is gone. Bathsheba mourns for her husband. This is their typical mourning period. And then David sent for her to be his wife. And she had a son. And, and all seemed to be well, but The Lord sent Nathan the prophet to rebuke David. Nathan told David a story about two men. And and you know, when when Nathan was coming before David, he's probably thinking, I can't just come out and say, David, you're a liar, you're an adulterer, you're a murderer, and, and and expect that David wouldn't respond with, off with your head, you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Sorry, I feel like I'm losing my voice right now. <clears throat> so, um, but, so David, or so Nathan comes up with a story to, to teach David, to, to tell him what, what, really what it looks like, what he's done. So there's a, there's a story about two men. One of the men had, was very rich and had many flocks and herds. And the other one was very poor and had one little ewe lamb. It was like part of the family. It was kind of like a dog. It slept with the children. It ate near the table. It was, it was beloved of the whole family. But the, the, old, the other, the, the rich man had a visitor come, a traveler. But he couldn't spare any of his flock for his traveler. Maybe he didn't know him very well, but... but when you had someone that was traveling by and came to your house in those days, you, you fed them, you, you made them a meal. And so, and you offered them a place to stay. So maybe this wasn't someone that he knew very well. Maybe it was just an acquaintance. And so he didn't, um, he couldn't spare any of his flock. So instead he went and he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and fed his visitor. David, David, after hearing this, becomes angry. And in his anger, he just starts spouting off. First, he said that the man should die. Then he said that he should repay the man four four times what he stole. Now, it's pretty hard to pay back after you're dead, right? That wouldn't. That doesn't work. But I really think that David was just saying the first things that came to his mind. He was just talking faster than he could think. Oh, yeah, he should die. Oh, and he should pay back four times. Uh, it, it was more just like a reaction that David had. And so, <clears throat> um, as soon as, as he stopped for air and, and he said, well, who is this man? Nathan told him, thou art the man. He told David what the Lord had told him. David thought that he'd gotten away with his sin, but God was showing him that even though the consequences didn't come right away, God knew all along. And sometimes God gives people time to repent, 
to see if they will say, I've sinned against you, Lord, forgive me. But David hadn't said that yet. And, you know, we've seen that David was a man after God's own heart, but we also see that David was still a man and he still had a sin nature. And so he wasn't above sinning, of course not. So God brought David face to face with his sin. He saw what his sin caused him to do. and He didn't like it. He was broken over his sin, not just out of guilt. You know, sometimes we have this guilt, you know, we hit our brother or sister, or we don't do, we don't clean our room when we're supposed to. And we get this guilty feeling. And so we go say sorry to our brother or sister, but we don't really mean it. We're just saying, sorry, I hit you. Like, I, I didn't mean, I, but uh, sorry, I hit you. And this is a more common thing to say, sorry, I hit you, but you shouldn't have said what you did. To, to justify what you did, you say, well, you shouldn't have done this. But really, it was wrong on both of your parts, but you need to take responsibility for your own actions. And David was taking responsibility for his actions. He, he took a true, honest look at himself. And as he was looking at himself, he saw the lies. He saw the adultery. He saw the murder. And he broke down before the Lord. You know, this wasn't a typical human response. What do we normally do when somebody says, you've sinned, that was wrong? What's our normal response? It's to get defensive, right? And, and I'm as guilty as, as you guys are. I, I get defensive when people tell me um, what, what I, that, that I've done something that I shouldn't have. But David responded in humility and true repentance. And God forgave him because God knew his heart. God knew that he was truly repentant. However, there were still consequences. The son that was born to David and Bathsheba was going to die. So when the child got sick, David still fasted and prayed. And, and the servants were so concerned about him because he, was, he wasn't eating. He was, he was in sackcloth and ashes. And when the child actually did die, they, they, were, they were concerned on whether to tell him or not. And so they were whispering. But David saw the whispering and he's like, he knew that the child was dead. He said, is the child dead? And they said, yes. And, and so then he, he gets up. He cleans himself up and he eats. And, and after his reaction to the child illness, they were afraid of how he would respond to the death. But David told them that he'd only fasted and prayed because that while the child was still alive, God might still be merciful. And I think that tells a true, a true faith in God that David had. David had mourned, but now... Now he knew that, that nothing could change what had happened. And so, so he, he cleaned himself up, he ate, and, and he, he moved on. Um, yes, it was sad, but he, was, he knew that, that nothing was going to change that. And so um, he didn't become angry or bitter against God. And, and because David showed a true... He, he had repented and God had forgiven him. There were still consequences. And David understood that. And because he did, um, you know, he was able to move on and, and still trust God. Now, God did allow Bathsheba to have another son. And they named him Solomon. And you probably know that name. He was the next king over Israel. He was also the wisest man to ever live. And so God still blessed David, even though David had sinned. But David repented of that sin, and God blessed him afterwards. And so um, we can just remember that God knows what, what is happening and what's going on in our lives, and he knows when we do what's wrong. And the best thing that we can do isn't to get defensive about sin, but to really just go before God and say, I've sinned. I'm sorry. I, I did what was wrong. Forgive me, please forgive me, and then move on. Because God says, 
that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all sin God can cleanse us from. So I encourage you with that today. Um, I'm going to pray, and then I'll let you go to your classes. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your love for us. And Lord, thank you for David and for his, his heart of repentance. And I pray that you would help um, us to have that same heart and that same um, reaction to sin. And I pray that you would be with my students as they have their classes today. Give them a good day today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll see you in the next lesson.